Morning, everyone. I am Charles Payne sitting in tonight for Mike Perry, the director of the Army, Army Heritage Center Foundation. On his behalf, I'd like to welcome all of you to tonight's presentation. Tonight we have uh, with us Mr. William Albrecht. His topic, of course, will be on the Vietnam War entitled Abandoned in Hell, the fight for Vietnam's firebase Kate, 28 October to 2 November, 1969. At this time, Mr. Albrecht, I'll turn it over to you. Well, well thank you very much, Chuck. It's truly it's really an honor to, to be here and to participate in this, uh, oh, this slice of history that we're about to discuss. Uh, in 1966, I graduated from uh, Allman Catholic High School in Rock Island, Illinois, and I knew that I wanted to serve my country. I knew that ever since I was in high school, ever since I was a little kid, I knew that was someday I would be a soldier and serve my country. We came from a very patriotic family and we all felt that we had a debt. And I also wanted adventure. I had a sense of adventure. I wanted to do things I would not normally do, like jump out of an airplane. So in 1966, I went down to the Army recruiter with my best buddy, Joe Murphy, and he said, what can I do for you guys? We said, we want, to, we want to join the Army. We want to be airborne infantry, and we want to go to Vietnam. Well, after he realized that we weren't just joking around, he, he said, well, I got two slots left, but this is your lucky day. And we, uh, we joined the, the Army, and I left the 3 October 1966. And through the process of testing, as you did back then when you got in the Army, they came to me and said that you have qualified to take the officer candidate test. Now, they called it the OCS test, and I didn't even know what OCS was. I mean, I'm 18 years old, barely. And OCS could have been Oklahoma Cook School for all I knew. But I took it. The passing score was 115. I achieved the score of 115, and they said, you are OCS bound. So here I am, 18 years old, never really been away from home. Now I'm heading down to Benny School for Boys, Infantry OCS. And it was a challenge. It was a real, real challenge. But myself and my classmates, we, we, we got through it. They said, the first day on the grinder, look to your left, look to your right. The men on your left, your men on your right will not be there for graduation. And they were, they were correct. We lost 50% of our class. But those that did make it, um, they, they, all, they all were good, solid infantry officers with little to no experience. My first assignment, well, I volunteered for special forces and I was accepted. So I went to jump school and I was fortunate enough to get into the special forces officer qualification course. And I got out of there and uh, stayed at Bragg. My first assignment was, believe it or not, Thailand. So I went to Thailand for a year to train a Royal Thai Army. My brother, Bob, was in Special Forces, was in Vietnam, and I'm pretty sure they weren't gonna have both of us there at the same time, the same unit. Get ready to get out, and they said, uh, you know, you're gonna be, uh, you've done your two years as an officer, and we're gonna discharge you in 1968. And I said, no, I wanna spend one more year, but only if I can go to Vietnam with the 5th Special Forces and serve. I felt that I had been trained and there was people going to Vietnam that well, were trained. And I felt that I was in a better situation, a better position to actually go there and serve my country better. Plus, it was something that I joined to do and I hadn't finished yet. So I went. I arrived October. I'm sorry. I arrived in mid-August. Excuse me. I turned 21 mid-August 1969. I was promoted to captain 31 August 1969. Arguably the youngest captain of Vietnam, but certainly the most the youngest to command combat troops. I went there, I was assigned to two corps uh, special forces unit at Bu Prang. Bu Prang was in the southernmost part of two corps. And uh, it was uh, pretty close to the Cambodian border, maybe five clicks. <clears throat> this was in September and there was a huge buildup of uh, the North Vietnamese is going to start, the monsoons are over, they're going to start their new offensive for 1969. 
we were getting prepared. We, uh, our target, our camp as a target was high on their list and they wanted to knock the camp out and then proceed on the Bami Tuit, which, which was a provincial capital in Southern Tukor. In the readiness to that, they surrounded the camp, well, three points with three fire bases, Annie, Kate, and Susan. They're triangulated around uh, Buprang, so when we got attacked, we could get fire support artillery. At these particular Annie, Kate, and Susan were about 27 to 30 artillerymen manning the 2155s and 1105 howitzer, it's a very small base. And we had probably about 130 indigenous mountain yard strikers that provided security. And they were taken from the different A camps, special forces A camps in the area. So Buprang had some uh, there, and plus uh, some of the uh, other camps uh, participated. To command those and to command all the security, one captain was, uh, was there, plus a sergeant who was overall in charge of the base but did not interfere in any way, shape, or form with the artillery. So as I'm getting ready to the camp for the big siege, as they say it's gonna come any day, the colonel comes out to give him an intelligence briefing. See, I was the executive officer there at the time as a young captain and a senior captain was the CEO. And we had a reinforced 18, we had like 18 guys instead of 12. He said, uh, Captain Albrecht, you're going out to Firebase Kate, uh, Captain Barnum's coming in, and he's going on R&R &R and you're going to take over. I said, but sir, but sir, there's nothing going on there. We've got there to sit on my ass and I need to be here and get this camp ready for the big offensive. Yeah, that's nice. Be on the next helicopter out. And I was, yes, sir. And I arrived at Firebase Kate about 3 p.m. on 28 October, 1969. And I never got a briefing because the guy really jumped on a helicopter and he was gone. But Sergeant Danny Pirelli, a finer SF trooper you're never going to meet, Buck Sergeant, was there. He had gotten there the day before. One uh, chopper took off. <clears throat> I dumped my rucksack. I said, uh, I took a look around first and I noticed that the, the, there was a lot of volleyball playing going around. There was a lot of card games going around. There was a lot of napping in the sun going on. And nobody seemed to be busy doing any type of uh, reinforcement of their of the fortifications that were around there. So I said, Danny, what's uh, what's going on here? He said, Sir, I got here the day before. Maybe maybe we ought to take a walk about. So we did. We did. We walked the perimeter, and it was not good. Their uh, concertina wire was overgrown. The fields of fire obviously weren't cut. Wasn't enough claymore mines. The fossils were dig. dig uh, dug deep enough. There was zero overhead cover. It was a very lackadaisical attitude. I said, Danny, what about patrols? Uh, do we know what's around us? And he goes, uh, no, apparently they, uh, the mountaineers go out to do a little hunting, and that's about as much as, uh, as it goes. And so we didn't know that in the dense foliation that surrounded Firebase Cape and this mountainous area of Tukor, what we really had. So I said, Danny, tomorrow morning, I want to take a reinforced squad and I want to go out there and let's do some clover leaf patrolling and see what we have. That he says, absolutely, let's do that. Sun is getting low in the sky now. Oh, by the way, I called a meeting with all the officers and, and uh, uh, NCOs to include the mountain yards. They had their own structural command, command structure. No more volleyball, no more card playing, no more any of this anymore until we get this place battle worthy, which it is not now. Of course, oh, do you know something we don't know? I said, I don't know anything about that, but I do want to be ready in case it happens. Didn't go over all well, but didn't really care. So the sun's getting low in the sky. It, it came, came dark early, and when it got dark, it got dark. There was no ambient light anywhere. Went to bed that night and we had, Danny and I shared a bit of a bunker and uh, had a sleeping bag or poncho liner, I should say, and I took my boots off. And anytime you're in the field and you can take your boots off, that's a good night. About 
all hell broke loose. I heard all this smaller fire, boom, 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 back and forth, back and forth. And I jumped up immediately. I put my boots on. And by the way, that was the last time I never took them off the rest of the time. And I ran to the north end of Firebase Cave. Firebase Cave was probably maybe 80 meters by 60, 40. It was kind of a, kind of a figure eight type uh, uh, concentric area. And going off the north end of Firebase Cave was about thigh high grass down the hill, all around it, to the dense jungle at the below and then there were, and we'll see a map of this then there was a gap that led because we were in a saddle the saddle gap led to another hill with dense foliation on top that was what they called ambush hill ambush hill is where they put on a night listening post every night so i'm standing there at the edge of north uh, kate we're in radio contact and the mountain yards come back and they are running buku vc buku vc well buku of course french a lot and VC was anybody that shot at him was VC. So uh, I debriefed them for what they, they said. A large force had come in, but they had stopped them or well, fired upon them, I should say. And it was an overwhelming force, and they, and they uh, did him out, came back. So I called up Spooky. And uh, Spooky came in, the Alabama boy, Spooky 4-1. And they fired all around the area, all around, completely around Firebase Cave. Till about 2.30 in the morning. And I felt, well, you know, I don't know what was out there or is, what is out there, but um, I figured, well, we pretty much did all we could. Tonight and tomorrow, I'm going to be out there uh, on patrol and find out what happens. Next morning, pre-dawn, just at the crack of dawn, incoming. Uh, B-40 rockets, uh, recoilless rifle and mortars. And like I told you, the defenses were not good. And we took casualties, numerous casualties. And I got up and we started doing uh, first aid. And we started patching these guys up. We started bringing in the medevacs and they came. Those guys were phenomenal. We started loading them up and I said, Danny, let's, let's go see what's going on out there. So we went off the north end of Ambush Hill. And I might add here that Shirani Firebase Gate on the east, west, and south, very steep terrain, very steep terrain. But the north end was more of a gentle slope that went down to this gap, which you could probably drive a deuce and a half through. And then it opened up into more of the thigh high grass and another hill, ambush hill, with a dense foliation on it. And again, we're going to see pictures of this. So I took about 20 some odd guys and I said, canteens, ammo. Let's go. And we took off uh, and we went down and we got on top of Ambush Hill. And sure enough, there was a, a pith helmet there, uh, shot, shot up NVA, blood trails leaving. So we continued down the north slope of Ambush Hill. And in true military fashion, point, flank security, tail security, main body, boom. We got a point guy within about 30 meters and they opened up from the wood line. We go down, cover concealment. Well, we, we had concealment because of the tall grass. We certainly didn't have cover. Withdrew, found a more of a rise in it, uh, on the side of the hill, got behind that, spread out, started returning fire. I didn't know what I had, but it was certainly taken under fire. In the meantime, I call for a forward air controller, a FAC, forward air controller. I need air support. I want to know what I got here, and I want to call an air support on top of it. There was nobody around, but they said, we're going to get you somebody. We slide off to the right or, uh, of uh, Ambush Hill into the dense foliation. And I put them out on the line because we're going we're, we're gonna to flank them. Infantry 101. We're going to flank them, come around Ambush Hill and hit them from, uh, and, and take them up and hit them and roll them up. As we were moving to contact, a uh, uh, Ford Air Controller got on, on, the, on, on the process and he started looking around. He goes, hey, Hawk, call sign was Hawk. Actually, it came later, but that was my call sign. Hey, Hawk, 
I see you. I see what you're doing. He says, but you've got to get out of there. He says, there are a lot of bad guys in there. He says, you got to pull back a lot more than you got. So I did. I pulled back to that rise that on the hill by Firebase Cave. And I then started uh, trying to call in some fire. But again, we didn't have any artillery on call and we didn't have any uh, um, air assets. So about that time, Moldy Mountain Yards came and said, hey, we're missing a man. So I had John Strange, who was the pterodactyl Ford Air Controller, fly over. He says, you got a man down in, in, the, in the tall weeds, in the tall grass, where you, uh, where you took on the enemy. So I said, OK, here's what we're going to do. Danny, Danny Pirelli, with me, my right-hand man, I said, you open up fire when I tell you. Keep your heads down. I grabbed a couple mountain yards, took our rifles, and when he did that, we ran as fast as we could. We found him, slung him over his shoulder, and we ran back. Didn't get fired upon when we first broke out uh, of our positions, but on the way back we did. But by the grace of God, we did not get hit, myself in a few yards. We got him, we got first aid, he was headshot, and it was bad. It was very bad. But we were patching him up there, and in the meantime, Port Air Controller says, you, you, you got to get out of there. He said, they're coming at you in a pincer. They're coming around both sides of you. They're heading towards the gap. And if they get you, that was it for me. I didn't have enough ammo. I didn't have enough men to put up a sustained fight. So we went down through the gap as quickly as possible up the north side of M uh, Firebase Gate with our wounded. And we got there and we buttoned down and, and let the games begin. What had happened? There's two elements to the NVA, the 66 NVA, the, the uh, regiment, the same one Hal Moore fought in 1965, and we were soldiers once and young, and the 28th NVA regiment, plus another regiment of artillery, fuel artillery, had come down from the north for this offensive. Their intention was to hit uh, Buprang, knock him out, hit uh, Bambi to it, and then march to the sea, cut Vietnam in half. And all of a sudden, they got this fire base in their way. And they figure, well, we'll just knock out this fire base quick. quick. I had no idea, no idea whatsoever that we were that vastly outnumbered, but we were. It was three dozen to one. But we had air power. And my God, when we started bringing in the fast movers, the, the phantoms coming in there, it was almost nonstop. And when the phantoms worked, we were then bringing in the uh, choppers uh, and the, they were flying in close air support and they, they were magnificent, magnificent. So we, we were able to withstand these massive ground attacks. Hundreds, hundreds came pouring out of the uh, wood line and attack. Now they were attacking on the, the steeper side of Firebase K because that's, that's where the, most of the cover was but we were able to repulse them with our firepower and the guys that were dug in those foxholes, they were very deep and head overhead now. And we, we did, we repulsed them several times. They broke perimeter a couple of times, but I had a reaction force of American artillery guys that were now infantry and we would uh, run to the scene with an M60 machine gun, wherever the break was, and we were able to repel that attack too. The artillery pieces were gone, they were shot. They had them zeroed in, they were inoperable. And uh, they tried, they even got one replaced real quick, but that was no good, they had it. everything zeroed in. It was suicide to be out there to man those pits. They became infantry. So we held on, we held on. The emergency resupplies were coming in for ammo and uh, was coming on pretty, pretty regularly. They were, uh, so this is day, let's see, day one, two, three, and so on. They performed magnificently. We were getting our butts handed to them. <clears throat> we were taking casualties, but not as many as you might expect, <clears throat> excuse me, because we were dug in. But we were coming desperately low on water, desperately low on water, and it was hot. And in combat, you just have this tremendous thirst. 
And when you're that bad off on water, it seems like it's the only thing you think about is, God, I would love to have some water. And they got flew in one of these water buffaloes. They had jettison and drop it, but it landed safely in, a, in an area where they couldn't get a direct hit on it from the enemy. And we were able to, after the sun went down, uh, get out there and uh, everybody get water. Ammo was critical. We never had a point where we had more ammo than we knew what to do with. But they kept bringing it in. They would bring it in as much as humanly possible. And I go into, I go into depth in this and in my writings about it. Um, about day four, all of a sudden, the earth shook. And we were getting incoming. And this wasn't mortars. And this wasn't rockets. And it wasn't recoilless rifle. This was artillery. Now, these, these bunkers were made of, of, of a wooden dirt, okay? And we couldn't sustain this. So I called the forward air controller. I said, we're, we're getting heavy stuff, heavy, heavy, heavy. He says, he says yeah, he says, let me, hey, let me fly. So we flew over to Cambodia, which we were about a click and a half away from. And at Camp La Roland, which was a Cambodian army base, the NVA had set up their artillery pieces, and they were now in full operation shooting at us. This is my first time in combat. I, 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 I knew pretty much everything I did because I'd been trained, and now I was faced a situation. I didn't know what to do. I said, well, well strike him, hit him, send him there. He just can't do that. That's a, uh, that's a neutral country. They're in a neutral spot. I thought, oh, my Lord, what am I going to do? I can't sustain this. And he goes, the only way I can do that is if the ground commander, me, uh, declared a tattoo emergency. I said, I declare a tattoo emergency. Roger. And they went in there and just bombed the piss out of it. My name ended up on Nixon's desk within an hour as a, as a young captain who has uh, created an international incident with uh, Cambodia twice because I did it again. And we silenced those guns. But now we had to deal with everything that was still around us. And on the 31st of October, they brought in 37 millimeter anti-aircraft weapon. And they put it in the south side, south side of ambush, I'm sorry, Harvey's Gate on the hill. And when Joker 8-5 came in on final, he came in hot, he came low, he came in fast. They blew him out of the sky. He went down in flames and Nolan Black, his entire crew, died instantly. It was, it, it, to this day, it, it gives me shivers because we could feel the heat. We were, they were so close. That ended my close air uh, helicopter support, and, and rightly so. It was just suicidal with this gun out there. So now the chopper support was down to resupply and medevacs. And they in the resupply, they came in hot and fast, dropped it, jettisoned it, hopefully landed in Kate. Some, one particular load didn't. It rolled back into NVA. First time in the history of war, we actually resupplied the enemy. But that's another story. I know the guy that brought it, brought it in. That's his claim to fame, he says. If they wanted me to hold this worthless piece of property, I needed reinforcements. I had no problem doing this, but I needed more ammo, I needed more water, and I needed more boots on the ground. The word went up. It went up to American forces, and the 4th Division was 100 clicks north of us. 10,000 men, 4th Division, a fighting unit, a fine unit. And to our uh, west was uh, Bambi Tuit, and they had, I'm sorry, to our east, Bambi Tuit, and the uh, 23rd Armin, Army Republic of Vietnam Division was there. 10,000 men. We need help. We are vastly outnumbered. We've got the enemy. This is our job is to, is to engage and close with the enemy. We have them here. Send help quickly. The Americans were going to come. They said, hey, yeah. We can do this. Richard Nixon was Im implementing uh, Vietnamization at the time. Let's let the Vietnamese start fighting this war. What a great opportunity. Let's do that. So American forces stand down. They went to the Vietnamese. You got to go in there and get those guys out. They said, uh, no, we're not going to do that. They said, no, you have to. They said, no, we don't have to, nor are we going to. So they refused. 
but the mobile strike force, the two core Mike force, the mobile strike force special operations unit who had battalions of airborne mountain yard strikers, highly trained, highly paid. They said, we'll come in. So they took a reinforced battalion, which would have been about six, 650 men, and they were gonna insert them. And I could actually see where the landing zone was with, with glasses, even with, without. And I could see them several kilometers away. They landed. Oh my God, the Calvary's coming. Oh, this is great. They hit the ground. They probably, by my estimation, got 150 to 180 men on the ground. I not only saw it, but the NBA did too. And they immediately sent over probably 1,000 infantry to confront those men, to fight those guys. They were not dug in. I was dug in. They were not dug in. They fought like banshees, but the NBA pushed them back. And I'm watching to this, and I'm listening on the radio. They pushed them back further. They took a stand. They and they pushed them back further. And this time they had to retreat. They couldn't withstand the casualties and the firepower the NVA <clears throat> was putting on them. So they withdrew and they said, Hawk, we can't get to you, you gotta come to us. About that time, my, my, my heart sunk, my heart sunk. I said, Lord, if we're gonna get out of here, I'm gonna have to get these guys out of here. We're on our own. We're all on our own as a team. So I called a meeting. I took counsel with the mountain yards who wanted out. They said, let's go, let's go now. And I said, not yet. And the Americans, the officers and the NCOs, I took counsel. I said, gentlemen, here's our options. Number one, we can surrender, but that will never happen. Number two, we can die in place, but to what end? This isn't the Alamo, we're not buying time for Sam Houston and Raising Army. Or number three, we're going to attempt a breakout, and gentlemen, we are attempting a breakout. All was in agreement. I had made the decision. I radioed uh, command, and they knew our situation. They knew exactly our situation. Requested permission to abandon Firebase K. Didn't take them long. Permission denied. There's a three M's of leadership. The mission, the men, and me. Must accomplish the mission at all costs. After you do, you take care of your men. And if any accolades or promotions comes your way, me. Feel free to accept it. The mission, I had no mission. I was an artillery fire base. We had no mission anymore, but I did have men. And my new mission was to take care of my men. So I sent him another message. He called, we are leaving fire base cave. And I said it in the meantime, we, we went about throwing thermite grenades down the tubes, destroying all classified documents. Only things that you could carry on your back. I'm sorry, only radios you could carry on your back, weapons, steel pots if you want them, black jackets if you want them, all the ammo you can carry and all the water you can carry. We were critically low on ammo, critically low. We had enough maybe, maybe to repel one more ground attack, but probably not. They came back and they said, okay, permission granted, we're gonna do it at night and we're gonna bring in, Spooky is gonna shoot in front of you and you're gonna follow their fire and you must go to the left of Ambush Hill. This is the path they're gonna clear. Made it real clear, the word went out. We did everything, but we did it very surreptitiously. If you were looking at us from the NVA's perspective, you didn't see what we were doing. Night came, everything was done. We quietly huddled at the north end of Firebase Cape in total darkness waiting for Spooky to come on station so we could begin our breakout. Spooky calls up. Hawk, this is Spooky 5-3. Uh, uh, we got, we got uh, mechanical problems, we gotta go back. But don't worry, we got another one coming up on Fan Ray. Okay. Second one is in route. Calls, this is Hawk, he says, uh, this is spooky uh, on five. We have mechanical problems. We've got to go back. The fan rang. But don't worry. Another one's coming out. Well, Hawk's plenty, plenty worried by now. Plenty worried. I am waiting for them to spray. We can't get any artillery support. It's certainly no air support. It is the pitch dark. I said, I got to go make sure that we didn't leave anybody behind. So I ran 
the south end of Firebase Gate. And as I was checking the foxholes, make sure that nobody was left there, I could hear the NVA starting to come up the extreme uh, south end. And they were hearing clipping wires, our concertina, and our wires that we had on the lower. As I ran back to the north end, they started, they dropped uh, mortars on us, and we took casualties. I got back to the north end, I said, let's go. And we started out, we stepped into the night. We didn't get fired upon, we got down to the gap and my point man froze, froze solid about 30, 30 meters from the gap. He couldn't move, he was so afraid. I said, to the interpreter, I said, just have him follow me. If you ever knew where you were gonna die, this is the night I was gonna die, and this is where I was gonna die, at the gap. But there was little to no choice left. So I went ahead and led them through the gap, and I got in, and they weren't there, they weren't there. Oh my God, a miracle. There was enough moonlight that I could see what was going on, the men moving, and I stayed in the gap with the radio, talking to uh, command. And the point man was supposed to go to the left because Spooky was going to spray there, but there was no Spooky. But he went right. And I saw him going right, and I just, fine, we'll work it out. We went to the right. We went up very close to the top of Ambush Hill and down. Well, what was on the left was the NVA were monitoring our uh, everything we had to say. They had set up a huge ambush on the left hand side and they were they were going to take us out and they would have taken us out if but for the grace of god and the hand of god we didn't go to the right of the ambush hill but we went close enough to the top and then headed down into it. i am thinking i am linking up with an element of the mic force to be led back at the time we're heading down the mic force calls and says we couldn't get anybody out to you you're gonna to have to come all the way to us. And they were literally miles away. As we're penetrating the jungle to start this trek, we get opened up from the top of Ambush Show with a 51 caliber. And again, a miracle. They couldn't depress the barrel low enough to get us in the, as low as we were. And they were shooting about a foot over our heads. Immediately, I thought we were getting, Spooky was coming on station and firing at us. I should have known when I saw the green tracers, it wasn't, but I had a lot of things on my mind. And I'm yelling, ceasefire, ceasefire, and they're going, we're not shooting, we're not even on station yet. We returned fire. We returned fire enough to keep them busy and not let the NVA relocate, and we plunged into the jungle. And I mean, they're shouting, hey, over here, over here. This was no noise discipline at this time. But we were able to get everybody together, all the Americans and most of the Mountain Yards. One batch of Mountain Yards did actually branch off and take a different way back. But I had all the Americans, and we are going to link up the Mike Force, and we took off. And we moved quietly, stealthily, for hours, hours. And at one point, I stopped, everybody down, and I could hear people coming towards us. So I'm facing kind of north. They're coming on my left-hand side. So I called the mic force. I said, you are coming at me now. Your patrol's coming at me now. I'm on your immediate left as you're moving. And they said, we don't have anybody out. It was the NVA. They were probably six meters away from us as they came through this heavy jungle. They couldn't see us, total darkness, but we could hear them. And they, they went by us for a very long time, but they didn't see us. They continued, I waited, 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 till I ensure they're clear, up, move. I had a map, a red filter flashlight, and a compass. I knew the general vicinity where the mic force was, but I didn't know exactly where it was. About two o'clock in the morning, I said, I, this has got to be the area where they are. And through this field, 
of about 70, 80 meters of thigh high grass is where I believe they're dug in. So I, I, uh, about that time, I heard the distinct clank of a rifle being dropped. Ours or theirs? I don't know. So I call them. I said, uh, send somebody out to the clearing. We'll identify and, and, and I'll move my people into you. They didn't know what they had. They said, uh, they didn't know if we'd been captured or what. They said, you send somebody out to the clearing. I lead from the front. I've never asked anybody to do anything I hadn't done or wouldn't do. So I said, I got it. I briefed them. I told Danny, I said, this is a trap. Boom, get these guys evacuate this way. Um, hey, get out of this area. Go north to Bupran. Keep working. Keep quiet. Choppers will be out in the morning looking for you. I started across this field. And I said, I'm an American. Are you the mic force? And I said it about that tone. I didn't yell it and I didn't whisper it. I'm an American, are you the what Mike Force? I said this about four or five times. And now I'm on the edge of that wood line where I heard the rifle clank. And I step into the dense foliation wood line and I look down and there's a, there's a mountain yard in tiger fatigues and an M16 smiling up at me. And I go and I see Sergeant Stevens and Sergeant Simmons and they go, Hawk. Where's your troops? I said, cross way. He goes, get them. Right away, we got to get out of here. They're everywhere. We got to get out of here now. So I ran across the field. I got the guys and we, quick time, over there in the mic for We were exhausted. We were just exhausted. The mic force put us in the middle, put their people out front, their people on back, and off we went. 11.30 to November 1969, we walked in to Firebase Cape. That night, we lost one man, one American, and I, I think he literally was lost. That maneuver that we did as a unit, as a company-sized unit, was never done in Vietnam ever before. We broke through enemy lines with, at night with absolutely no support, and again, by the grace of God, we got through that. Obviously, I go into much greater detail uh, when I wrote the book, and I didn't really even intend to write a book. I just intend to chronicle the events, and one thing led to another. All right, sir, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. The first slide. The first slide is uh, in full battle regalia, and a sketch I drew of Firebase Kate afterwards. And this one, um, it's kind of hard to read everything, but it shows you Kate, the Gap, Ambush Shell, and roughly our route that we came. Okay, well, let's have the next one. Ah, again, great pictures. One of these I have framed. This is, uh, this is typical. You see the mountain yard in the background. He is uh, just atypical of, uh, of these gallant warriors. They'd be the equivalent to the American Indians. They were just wonderful great people and we the french is the first one to tap into their assets and use them as warriors but we were the uh we we're the second ones and they never let us down next slide please this is a snapshot well a picture of black and white of our team i'm on the far right as you're looking at it and just some of the guys that were there uh this is a team at Prang. the one on the right uh from that the three men in uniform i'm in the center and these are actually my two brothers, my brother Bob on the left, who's no longer with us, my inspiration, and my brother Don on the right. And uh, we, uh, this is a, a family treasure, an absolute family treasure. Below that is Charles Childers, Captain Charles Childers and myself, enjoying a stogie in between um, incoming at the Battle of Doxiang in 1970. Next slide, please. This gives you an idea, Kim, Kate, Ambush Hill and where Cambodia was. Uh, that Bu Prang is, is not actually where uh, the closest it is. It's kind of a, a Bu Prang is kind of an area. And there you can see the better uh, the, uh, Cambodia and Kate in there. Like I said, click, click and a half away. It was very, very close. By the way, Susan and Annie uh, took light fire and they were evacuated also. Next slide. 
Here's a picture of Firebase Kate. I took these pictures with the uh, Ford Air Controller the next day because they came in after we evacuated and they just bombed the hell out of it. And as you can see, they did a mighty fine job. But you can see on the one on the left, that is Kate. And that is the south side where the printing is. And then the, the north side, you can see the gap. And if you can continue, ambush shell, what's left of it. And then a closer on the right is a picture closer of the gap. And uh, as you would proceed to the right, we'll take you to ambush shell. Next one, please. Another view of Firebase Kate. This is taken from the north, looking south. Uh, you can see the terrain around it. I don't know who picked this slot out, but uh, this position of it wasn't good because uh, they were firing down on us from some of these places. But you see the Kate. We went off that north slope through the gap and onto Ambush Hill. Next slide, please. Here's a distant shot of Kate in the. Uh, to the rear, the gap, and part of Ambush Hill. But you can see how the terrain has this, well, it's hard to see it, but it's tall grass. That's why it looks so clear in there, a thigh-high grass. Next slide, please. Another schematic of uh, Firebase K. Just to give you a little bit more about it, I uh, drew this for uh, another reason, but showed you where the, the positions of the guns and uh, it's, like I said, a very rough sketch. That one's better. Uh, next, next slide, please. This is actually the route. Now, the black line represents that our actual route down the slope, through the gap, to the right side of Ambush Hill. And then, and actually we went down and when we got down in the valley, more to the right of there was when we were taken under fire. The red route on the left is what where we were told to go, and that's where the NVA were dug in, overhead cover, and they were going to rip us apart and would have, hadn't it been for the mountain yard uh, point to take a different direction. That is our E&E route. Next slide. Again, another shot at uh, Firebase Cade. You can see the destruction on that, um, pretty much the same as the uh, others. Uh, and the one on the left, you will see uh, where the printing is, that's where they launched their final attack. It came up through there. Next slide, please. Ah, on the left, that is Sergeant Stevens and Sergeant Simmons. In 1996, at Special Forces reunion of the Mike Force, which I ended up uh, actually going to the Mike Force and finishing my tour with the Tugor Mobile Strike Force. It's the first time I'd seen him since the morning of 2 November 1969 when we linked up. So I thought I'm uh, very, very fond of that. And then um, the, the handsome guy on the right, that's the way I look like now. Okay, next slide. A shameless plug for the book. Marvin Wolf is my co-author magnificent writer. He made everything I, I put down on paper turn to gold. The guy is gifted. He went out and interviewed everybody uh, that is in the book. And uh, I can't say enough. He made the book what it is. I merely lived it. He made it into something that has sold well over 27,000 copies now. Thank you, Marvin. That's it, sir. That's it, Chuck. I'm done. That's an absolutely great presentation. That, that's that's a, a wonderful expose on a very, very successful small unit action under some pretty trying circumstances. I found it absolutely amazing. Um, you're a pretty young officer uh, when this happens. What, uh, if you had one piece of advice to a young officer today heading out with, with soldiers for the first time, what would you, what would you say? Well, if you've been properly trained, as I was, I would go back to the three M's of leadership, which I learned in OCS, Oscani School, not Oklahoma Cook School, the mission, the men, and me. If you can remember that, the three M's of leadership, the mission, 
once it's accomplished, take care of your men and a distant third me. You, you can't go wrong. And rely on your subordinates for timely and good knowledge. But remember, as the commander, as the commander, the final decision is yours. It's not a democracy. You're not voting on it. You are merely, not merely, but you are taking their experience and their knowledge. And you're going to base your decision on that. Okay, here's a question. Could you expound a little bit on the reliability of the Montyard soldiers? The Montyard soldiers, like, like I said, uh, were uh, the, the Vietnamese, the regular Vietnamese, North and South, hated them. They, they considered them to be savages. They were kind of Iron Age. They wore uh, loincloths hunted with crossbows, burn and slash type of uh, population in their villages, they would live someplace three or four or five years. And when the, when the ground, the, their cornfields petered out, they burn it and move on to something else. The NVA took extreme advantage of them. And when they come down, they take their young men as, as uh, bears of ammo from the north and they would take their livestock, what little they had and what little rice they had. So when it came the opportunity that they could actually fight back that the French gave them, and then, of course, the French left and we came in. They took it up. The South Vietnamese considered them savages. And they had no rights. They couldn't vote. They were a step above uh, being slaves, as far as I'm concerned. That did change when they had a, a mountain yard revolt, so to speak. And the Central Highlands was the stronghold of the mountain yard. And the last thing I'll say to that is a thousand years ago, when the uh, Chinese came down from the north and landed on the shores of Vietnam to populate it, the mountain yards were driven into the mountains and that's where they remained. I see. Did you ever encounter any uh, any of those mountain yard soldiers again anywhere? There is a, uh, a colony of them outside uh, the Fort Bragg area, which we have brought in and we, it breaks my heart. Now the, my book, our book, Marvin's and mine is dedicated to the Mount Yard population. We told them this was gonna happen. We told them that at some point we're gonna withdraw and we're gonna be leaving you here. And, oh, well, you know, sure you are, we did. And there wasn't a lot we could do. They had stored ammo and they had stored weapons and they fought the NVA when they, when uh, well, that was the Vietnamese army as best they could. But in the end, they, uh, they went to the Central Highlands and the Vietnamese, um, conquered them, so let's say, put them to work, like I said, almost slaves now as uh, in the coffee fields. We were able to bring over a significant number, but not, not anywhere near what we should have brought over. Well, did they settle in the Fort Bragg area because of the special forces units uh, assigned to Bragg? Exactly. So, so the SF community was heavily involved in getting some of them out? Yes, and it still is. Um, and um, there's a organization, Save the Mountain Yards, I believe. I'm a, I am a, a member. And they have, uh, they're preserving not only the Mountain Yards, but their culture and everything they believe in. I remember I spoke at the Citadel, and there was actually a Mountain Yard young man there who was in the, uh, in the Citadel, who was going to become an Army officer. That was pretty cool. That is amazing that those descendants are now in our military, which is a wonderful thing. Have you spoken anywhere else to any other audiences? Have you ever spoken to any uh, active duty uh, reserve or guard SF detachments or anyone else about your story? Oh, yeah. I've, uh, uh, I was uh, the guest speaker at the First Army Command General Staff. I've been, um, the, uh, again, the First Army a birthday ball, I don't know, 400 plus that I spoke. And I, I, I speak on a regular basis uh, about, about the battle. And, and I try to drive, drive home the learning points of the battle, uh, decision-making, um, relying on your assets and, and, and different things I, I tailor to who I'm speaking to. So the answer to that is yes, on many occasions. That's good to know, because that's such a compelling story. Okay, last, last question. Um, as a Vietnam veteran, 
looking back uh, many decades now, any parting thoughts just to America in general about your service and that of your fellow Vietnam veterans? Quick, quick story. I'll, I'll shorten this up. At, at Cape, there was a, uh, <clears throat> a uh, young lieutenant, artillery lieutenant, Ron Ross, and he came out when one of the other lieutenants was badly wounded. He took his place. And when I was briefing him on 31 October 1969, first time I came in the day before, it's the first time I could talk to him, what's going on. It was, it was bad. Everything was bad that was going on at that particular time. And I noticed that he was wearing a wedding ring. I said, oh, you're married. And he said, yeah. And he pulled his helmet off. And in, it, in, the, in his helmet liner was a picture of a newborn child. And he said, yeah, I'm going, as soon as, as, soon as I get back, I'm going on r and &R. I'm thinking, the hell are you doing here? Uh, I meet my wife in Hawaii, and I'll get to see my son for the first time. Ron was killed uh, there. Uh, I was with him, and uh, he caught a piece of a B-40 rocket right in the jugular. And he bled out within not a lot of seconds, less than a minute. But I had him with me in my arms. And he, at least he died in the friends of a, died in the arms of a friend. And I thought, you know, when I get home, I'm going to go see his folks in Appleton, Wisconsin, which isn't that far from where I live on, in, the, in the Quad City area, the Mississippi River. But life has a way of getting in, in the way. Life has a way of getting in the way of doing things. And I had the best intentions of the world. I wanted to let them know that their son died and how he died, what he died, and, and that he died in the arms of a friend. Comfort him. But I never did. I didn't get around to it. But then after the book started coming out, and we were doing the research before the book. We had, we found his son. His son was in uh, Waterloo, Iowa, which is again, I'm in Bettendorf, Iowa, it's not that far. So we made arrangements with, again, the first army who was based at the Rock Island Arsenal. And we had a presentation of the Purple Heart and his father earned a silver star. We had a presentation down here. His son came down to his family. And I sat down and I was able to talk to his son and tell his son exactly what happened because he had zero knowledge of how his father died in Vietnam. What it did, when we came home, it was, it was a tough time to be a Vietnam veteran. I'm not whining or complaining, it just was. And now as you see, there's a lot of respect for guys that served, served with honor. As, as Ronald Reagan said, they served with honor. And for me, the respect that is now being seen and given to all our veterans, but especially our Vietnam veterans, this closed the circle for me when I was able to sit down across from his son and tell his son about how his father died and how his father died in my arms and, and, he, and he died in the, in the arms of a friend. It was, it was a very touching moment. I'll give you that. But it was also closure. Closure for me and closure for him. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Bill. That, thank you. That, that's really meaningful. And, and those kind of stories, I'll tell you, I think are uplifting for all of us. Uh, as a veteran myself, it certainly is for me. I want to thank you so much for your presentation tonight. I hope that we'll hear from you. And as you and I discussed, hope we'll, we'll see that book eventually at AHEC. Yeah, and, if you uh, count on that, I'll even sign it. <laughs> please hey, do. It's, it's please been, do. Uh, and if you're ever in this area, please stop by. It'd be a real pleasure to meet you. Chuck, it's been my absolute honor to be a part of this, be a part of the, the history of, uh, of the Vietnam War. I'm, I'm truly touched and honored to be this part. Thank you so much for having me on this program. Thank you for stepping forward and doing this. And to all of you that, that attended tonight, thank you so much. We hope you'll join us again. And in the future, Bill, if you ever want to come up with another one, let us know and we'll look forward to it. All right, sir. All right. To all, have a good evening.